So for those who have not seen part one, our guest today is Paul Kahn, President of Global Capital Markets at Computershare. Welcome back, Paul. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Jack. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to do the part two. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've got tons of uh, follow-up questions, so it's, it's much appreciated. So to start off this AMA, I think the main thing that we noticed and want to clarify some details with you on, and it's, and it's taking a step back, and it might be helpful for our audience if you can clearly define what the difference is between what a broker does versus what computer share does. Okay, well, that, that's a great question. I'm glad we're starting with that. I mean, it's clear from the discussion that's going on in the marketplace that people are comparing and contrasting the different types of transaction and dealing services that computer share offers and they are absolutely doing like a tail of the tape comparison to what online brokers offer and i think stepping right back it's important to understand what a broker does and what a transfer agent does i'm not here to tell you what a, a broker does but i can tell you what we do as a registrar and a transfer agent we are able to offer these services in conjunction with um, our broker, um, a third party broker. But what we don't do is we don't offer financial advice. We're not financial advisors. So that's a, a key distinction. We offer these security. So we offer these services for the securities that we offer our corporate clients, registry or transfer agency services for. So we provide investors with access to a subset of the market not all securities in the market, not other types of financial products and crypto and things like that. Um, we don't provide cash accounts. So when people buy securities through us, we expect them to get the money to us um, to enable us to do that transaction on their behalf. Equally, when we sell securities on their behalf, we dispatch the funds to them. We don't run cash accounts in the same way that a broker does. That's another very important distinction. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the final distinction is we don't provide any facilities for um, leverage or margin or lending. So that's a, a fundamental difference between what we do in running registers for companies and through that registry process, being able to offer access to dealing services so okay. hopefully that helps your your audience kind of clear up some of the macro. I know we're focusing on the micro. The micro is important, but it's important to kind of set the, the stage in the macro terms first. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly agree, especially since the majority of what we'll go through is it, pretty micro, as you said. So moving on to the micro, we'll, we're, we've got some clarifications from the last interview. And we'll tend to ju jump around a bit in terms of the questions, so bear with me here. Um, but one of, the, one of the largest ones um, that we discussed la uh, last AMA was uh, sell orders through CS. Uh, but there's still some vagueness around placing multiple orders uh, at high prices um, specifically. So uh, I'm going to give this scenario and I want to understand if it sounds correct um, based on what we inferred from the last AMA. So is it correct in saying that an order is capped at 1 million, but the maximum limit sell for a share is at 250,000, which means you'll be able to place one order for four shares at a limit sell price of 250, totaling 1 million. Okay, I'm gonna try not to be vague here, but I'm gonna answer that <laughs> in, a, in a yes and a no and, and break it into its two constituent Oh, the, first, the first relates to aggregate value as opposed to limit order prices. As it relates to aggregate value, um, I mentioned that we had this $1 million um, dollar threshold, but that people could put multiple orders in through the system. Um, noticing that there is a lot of um, chatter around what happens when you have very high priced um, securities you know, you're, the math that you just laid out is, is, is correct. But what we're looking to do, and I, I can't give you a firm date um, on when this will happen, you know, next week or the following week, or you know, I hope it will be in place before the end of the year. We're looking to significantly increase the aggregate value um, cap mm -hmm. say, limit, and that would actually increase the number of shares that you could push through the pipe on any one order while still having the ability to put multiple orders through the system. So that's something I'm hoping we'll be able to bring some relief to very quickly. 
as it relates to the second um, element, which is around the maximum limit order price. Um, that number is um, above 200,000 and below 250,000. We're still looking at that. There are some technical changes that we would need to make and um, how we interact with our broker. Um, we'd need to obviously have our straight through processing systems change to, to deal with a higher limit order price. We're not yet at a point where we're ready to um, just start changing our systems. Um, you know, we're well aware of the of the chatter that's going on. There's nothing stopping um, someone putting an order, a market order through us at, you know, at a price that's much, much higher than that. Um, mm -hmm. Or indeed someone could sell through their own third party broker if they wanted to. And I'm these things are all interrelated. So looking to give some relief on the aggregate value cap per order while still allowing multiple orders, not yet looking to make any changes to the maximum limit order price, yep. um, but recognise that market orders above that can go through into the marketplace and that people can still continue to transact through their broker if they so choose. So hopefully that clarifies where we are. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think people will find it reassuring that you're actually looking into that as well. So it's, it's appreciated. Yeah, we are, we are. There's, there's a lot of work going on in the background to, to understand what these issues are <laughs> and what may need to happen. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so moving on to broker selling, you said in the part one of the AMA that people can directly register, people can be directly registered on your books themselves through their self-ready broker. I know personally, I would love to direct register my sh my shares in various stocks, but hold them in my broker. Could you describe how this process uh, actually works step by step? Yeah, I, I will. And, and Jack, I, I haven't been back through the transcript. And firstly, thank you for um, doing the transcript because I know that's very helpful to your, your, your audience. But I haven't been back and checked the transcript specifically. But what I... What I want to kind of convey, you can hold stock in your name in DRS form and deal through computer share to sell, or you can have your shares transferred to your broker so you can affect the sale through your broker. You can't hold your shares at your broker and at computer share at the same time. So they can only be in one place at any one time. So I just want to clear that point up. Um, as for the question I think you're asking, which is, can you hold your securities in DRS form at computer share and execute an order on a brokerage platform? Um, I think that's kind of where you're, where, yeah. where some of the, the logic is going. And the answer to that is there's no reason why that can't happen. The issue really gets down to who the broker is, how their brokerage platform works and what the relationship is between the broker and the client. If we focus on some of the online platforms um, where they require you to have stock in your account or cash in your account before um, an order can go on, it's highly likely the broker will say you can't sell through the broker until the shares are DRS back from computer share to the broker, which can be a, um, particularly for US brokers, that can be a, a pretty efficient um, process. But ultimately, it is something which you know each person needs to talk to their own broker about to see what they would be prepared to do, whether they put the order on, um, execute, and then bring the shares into the um, brokerage for, for settlement, or whether they would require the transfer to come into the platform pre-execution of the of the order. There's kind of two different ways. All right, great. No, I think that's I think that's good clarification. I think um Maybe we got the wrong inference based on what we. Yeah, and if, look, if I if I contributed to that, my my apologies. No, 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 not at all. I think it's it's very uh, complex lingo that it, can be. It, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been doing this for four decades, and I'm still learning things. You know, every month. <laughs> yeah, I'm certain. Um, so we also touched on uh, direct share registering reporting as well. I think it's every everyone's asking this question and it's human nature to want certainty when there's a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, and you said that CS is unable to share the total number of direct registered shares of a stock uh, and that falls mainly on the issuer of a particular stock instead. 
So people are wondering if computer share are able to share any metrics at all when it comes to stocks uh, that you are the transfer agent for, uh, such as total number of accounts, uh, average shares per account, et cetera, or, that's, or is that just totally locked away and responsible for the issuer? A response. So again, this is a good question. We have that data. Um, it's all available on our systems. What we can do with that data is subject to a contract with the corporate client. So we're not at liberty to regularly distribute um, or even distribute that information into the marketplace. We understand exactly why individuals are trying to understand how many investors go through the DRS process um, and also the aggregate percentage of issued capital that they control so you know we're we're talking to one or two of our clients about um, what this means and i think there's a reasonable case for this information to be made available periodically it's not something that we can do on our on our own but I, okay. I, i'd like to think that that may happen in the not too distant future yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I think um, obviously people <laughs> want to understand what portion of uh, retail investors yeah. have yeah. the company, so very natural. Um, so when it comes to, I think, clarifications for book entry versus direct stock purchase program. So we touched on it before, um, but we want to dive a bit deeper into it as well. And one of the main questions asked as a follow-up is the difference between book entry only shares and those purchased through the direct stock purchase program. Now, is there any difference in how these are directly registered? Okay, when it comes to ownership, direct registered uh, in the owner's name, but direct stock purchase is part of a pool. Does this mean that they are not in the owner's name in a way? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And we're going to go into a, another layer um, of detail um, here. So we've been very clear when shares are registered in DRS, they're registered directly on the register of the company in the individual's own name. So that's very, very straightforward. When people are buying shares through the plan, um, we record their names on a subclass within the register. So the names are visible to the issuer. Um, so just like the regular common shares, they're visible. Um, in a technical sense, we are holding a portion of those shares in a computer share nominee, purely so that we can affect efficient settlement within the, the market through DTC. Um, however, so that's kind of a general point. However, as I think I said last time, there's nothing stopping any investor at any point removing shares from the plan holding to the DRS holding. It can be done electronically. It's free. You know, there's nothing untoward here in, in what we're mm. doing. It's really just about how we can organize the um, security so that we can offer this um, direct stock purchase plan facility ef efficiently. Okay, uh, that's good to know. And are, are there any differences in how a hypothetical special dividend, such as an NFT, NFT dividend, would be issued? By, with either of these plans, or is it that? You know, that's that's a good question. I really can't get into the hypotheticals. Um, yeah. I can't because in, until such time as one of our clients says we're going to have a special dividend and this is how it's going to be structured, we won't have the opportunity to say, well, how does it relate to this part of the facility or that part of the facility? But I would envision um, that if a company did that, they'd want all of their shareholders on the register, be they in DRS um, or the share plan to to participate. But at the end of the day, that's going to be their decision. Um, yeah. We would work with them early on to to make sure they could give effect to that efficiently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, and last but not least is uh, verification process tips um, that people are yeah. seeking. So. As it takes a few weeks, uh, if not for mail to arrive to international locations, uh, when it comes to verification processing for those international customers, are there any tips you can offer us uh, when it comes to expediting that process at all? So we know um, some people are asking for expedited um, courier to, to get that to them. I mean, we're, we're very, very conscious um, of this issue. And since we last spoke, um, I've been working with Joe and Yin and the team at ComputerShare mm -hmm. to see if we can actually solve this particular problem. 
we are looking at the two and multi-factor authentication. Um, that's not something that we can implement for investor center registration quickly at this stage, but getting right to the point, we are looking um, fairly soon as it relates to Europe to print and distribute the DRS statements and the PIN packs um, mm. from a UK facility so that we can, you know, truncate the need to cross the Atlantic. Um, clearly, if there's a you know dispatch within the UK, that would be very efficient um, or much more efficient. And hopefully crossing the channel won't be too difficult either, um, easier than being mailed directly from the US into Europe. So I'm hoping that we can cut down some of the time through that particular process. The longer term solution is to bring around a two or multi-factor authentication process. Awesome. That's absolutely fantastic. Fantastic to hear that you're making progress on that. I'm sure people will be very happy to start receiving the, yeah. <laughs> the registration letter in a shorter amount of time. Yeah. We may, look, we are, we are making some progress in two-factor authentication once mm -hmm the investor is registered into Investor Center. So you'll see, we recently, I think it was just last week or the week before, introduced some two-factor authentication processes for people that are already authenticated into yeah. Investor Center. That's available now in Australia. Um, for those people that are looking at our services in the US, we've recently introduced um, some very quick access solutions called Quick access hub so people can google this computer share quick access hub um, you can register for sms text notifications and you can register for some very commonly used services and within some of those services we're using two-factor authentication so you know we're not quite as backwards as some people might have us uh, have you believe we are uh, but i know on the i know on the dispatch of the pin it's still causing a lot of noise, a lot of pain, and we're doing what we can to um, get closer to the investors so we can mail from them starting from Europe, and then maybe we'll be able to replicate that in Canada and Australia and New Zealand, but that's a bit further down the track. Yeah. Uh, it's good to hear regardless, so thank you. I'm sure everyone will be very thankful as well. I hope so, we are trying. <laughs> um, so we're moving on to the the functionality related questions now we, we were going to get into these in part one um, but now we can get into them in part two which yeah. is fantastic so people are interested in what capabilities uh, computer share provides for companies that choose you as their transfer agent so do companies commonly opt in for the feature that provides the option for live counts of registered shares so I, I think I touched on this last time. The corporate clients we have have real-time access to the register. So as we update the register, they are able to see the changes. I think that's a, a, a helpful point to note. However, I think I would um, separate that out from the company's ability to see what's going on inside the DTC where they don't have access to what's happening at a book entry level, either between brokers and banks or between each of those broker or banks and, and, and their clients. There's, there's no real time yeah. um, visibility of, of those movements at, at all. So, but as it relates to what comes onto our register, they can look into the register through our um, web facilities at any time and see a, a, a live count at that yeah. snapshot in time. Yeah, you're right. I think I definitely did answer that question. I mean, asked that question last time, so apologies. No problem. Don't worry. <laughs> um, the next one, which I don't think I asked, is platform reliability, um, which is kind of a concern. As users of Reddit, we're used to a really unstable platform and not being able to reg it, a log in regularly. Um, so naturally, this concern flows across to broker platforms that we use or transfer agent platforms that we use um, as well. So people are interested in what you uh, what your team has done essentially to ensure platform reliability. Okay, so that's a good question, and, and I can assure you didn't ask this question last time, <laughs> but I'm happy to um, answer it. We're regularly testing our platforms for um, volume processing, reliability, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're a regulated business, so we need to ensure that we can process the business that comes through the pipes. Um, efficiently. I think many of you will know that 
Today um, in the US, computer share already um, processes business for you know, millions of investors, some who still hold pieces of paper called share certificates and, and, and many millions whose shares are registered in um, DRS form. So, um, uh, you know, you, you, you never say volume is, is, is never an issue. Um, however, mm -hmm. I can assure you we're regularly testing our facilities and as things currently stand, I don't see any calls for concern whatsoever. Okay, no, that's great and reassuring to hear, so thanks. And we can we can move on to some more of the fun stuff now, which I'm sure people will be interested in, which is touching on Overstock. So I believe you're allowed to talk about Overstock as it's in the public domain. Is that right? To to the extent that it's in that it's in the public domain, no no problem. I mean, beyond what's in the public domain is a is a client agent issue. Yeah. So I'll, I'll ask the questions and I'll I'll answer as as much as I can. Yeah, okay, no worries at all. Um, it is kind of vague as well, this question. Um, so feel free to say if you can't answer or go into specific details, there's no worry. So um, it'd be great to get a general understanding of how that process transpired when it came to the overstock dividend and essentially what was the end result for the shareholders who directly registered the overstock through computer share and held with their brokers? Okay, um, that, well. that's a good question. And look, I can talk about that in general terms. Um, okay. Overstock distributed a stock dividend and that was subject to a regulatory filing. So I'm sure um, Overstock wouldn't mind if we updated our um, FAQ to include a link to the filing so that mm -hmm. um, people um, who are interested in getting into the detail can go off and take um, a look at the, the fine detail. But it was a stock dividend, a, a distribution. Um, we were asked to create the entitlement on um, Overstock subsidiary T0's blockchain. So we yep. calculated the entitlement to the dividend we distributed the dividend and we updated um, wallets on that particular blockchain. It was also distributed to CD and Co. Mm -hmm. And the DTC nominee holds um, securities on the ledger. Um, yeah. And DTC um, obviously took the entitlements that it had and passed them through um, into the hands of banks and, and, and brokers. But that's, you know, one step beyond what we were able to distribute. We can distribute to the direct registered shareholders, whether they're in DRS form or certificated form, and they all went on to the ledger directly. And mm. the shares that were held by banks and brokers um, were distributed through the DTC system. Yeah. When it comes to that wallet, are you saying that you had to pre-create the wallet and send the uh, distribution there? Can, can I answer that through the FAQ? Because I'm a little... <laughs> yes, I, I, I believe we did, but we'll, let, let's, let us come back to you and include that in the FAQ about who actually populated the wallet. I believe we did, um, yep. but I just want to be absolutely certain before... Yeah, um, no, no, answering that definitely. Include it in the transcripts um, for people to reference when, when they get to this point as well. Yeah, so, perfect. Okay. Great. Um, but that was really interesting. Um, thanks for that. I, I didn't really have a great understanding of the overstock process in terms of how it worked. Um, so thanks for going through it. The, the next section that we want to move on to is the DTC and FAST. We didn't really touch on it no. uh, too much before, especially the FAST component of how that transfer system works. And people have been rather curious about why shareholders uh, are not more encouraged to direct register their shares in their name. So I want to understand what your take on this as, is, as it's essentially a direct competitor of the DTC in a way. Okay, so there's probably three parts to that question, <laughs> and we're going to need to remind me as we um, a, as we work through that. Mm -hmm. um, but dealing with the fast agent issue first versus DRS um, generally. The, the, the fast agent arrangement relates to the administration of the CD and co-holding for DTC. Yeah. So as securities come out of DTC and we debit their ac account and credit your account, Jack, in DRS form, um, we're performing some of that processing on behalf of DTC for its account under the FAST 
agent rules. Mm -hmm. The DRS rules that relate to you coming onto the register are quite separate from that. And I know, you know, there's been some discussion that conflates those particular issues, but they really are quite distinct and separate. And the fast rules are what enable us to run the CD and Co account for DTC without having to have a physical certificate go backwards and forwards between us or for them to hold their securities in DRS. So they have a kind of special purpose, uncertificated account, and it's under those fast agent rules. That's the yep. first part of it. Okay. Can you give me the second part again, please? Because this whole yeah, brain... Yeah, yeah that's, that's no worries yeah. at all. Um, so people are interested on your take uh, in regards to why people aren't more encouraged. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So um, again, I, I think this issue is, it may also be being conflated and it, it's probably because, you know, this is not a common everyday occurrence, but I think there is, there's a delineation between issuers are not able to withdraw all of their securities from DTC. That's a DTC rule. Um, you know, I, I, I can't speak to that rule one, one way or the other, but it is there and issuers don't have the ability to just pull their shareholders' securities um, out, out of the system. So that, that I think, is, is governed by a, a rule. The piece that I'm not sure is whether that extends to issuers being able to just tell their shareholders what options they have available to them, one being their right to exercise choice to have their shares registered in DRS form. Um, yeah. I think I don't think there's any legal impediment to that. I'm not a lawyer. I'm happy to keep um, having a look at that and, and talking to um, our team about that. But I think there's a mm -hmm. subtle difference between those two examples that I just gave. But I think the discussion in the marketplace and in the forum is conflating those points. So I don't think there's an issue with a company telling their clients that they have a choice as to how they can hold their securities, e.g. in the street, through a bank or broker, um, or in DRS. Um, form. They just can't, on a wholesale basis, say we're going to take all of our um, shareholder securities out, out of the street system, which is obviously a fundamentally different thing. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's an interesting perspective because I think we've definitely been under the assumption that DRS isn't widely known about because the issuing companies aren't allowed to tell you know retail, hey, DRS shares. Uh, these are the benefits associated with. Uh, route yeah the direct registration yeah. i mean this might go to the third part of your question which was really about i think really more about competitive um elements yeah. i think just i mean going back to do people know about it i think you know banks and brokers have an interest in performing efficient clearing and settlement of trades that are executed mm -hmm. on the marketplace um the way in which they can do that most effectively is by having their clients holding their securities through the DTC system. So I think, you know, banks and, and, and brokers um, would have a preference to clients holding in that particular way. Um, yeah. I think many brokers would be very happy to register their clients um, in DRS form if that's what the client asks for. But I think mm -hmm. over time, you know, it's almost this DRS system has been around for, you know, best part of 20 years, if, if not 20 years. But it, it, mm -hmm. it's clear that recent events are focusing the spotlight on it. And it's almost as if it's you know, just been discovered. But that's probably mm -hmm. because, you know, a number of brokers, particularly those that deal in an online environment, don't really want to interact with external registers. So they just the brokers want the securities to come into the street system yeah okay well that that wraps up all the questions we have um it's much appreciated and i thank your time community shares time team's time for reviewing our questions and you know just giving us quality information it's, it's really greatly appreciated you're welcome jack and um thanks very much for the opportunity to come back and complete part two there was a lot to get in a single session um, I'm glad we've been able to chop it up into two sessions and we'll continue to monitor the discussion and I'm sure people will make their feelings known as we know yeah. how it's done now. We're catching up slowly. Well, we'll be back for a part three next year yeah, <laughs> as yeah. the questions start rolling yeah. in. I look forward to that.
<laughs> Great. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Thank you.